gonna start with the shirt. Sure, I'm gonna start on the shirt. See my shirt, guys? For everyone watching, this is my shirt. ONU. I'm not gonna go into detail on it for privacy reasons. Well, I don't think it matters. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's fine, yeah. Um, we had a member send these shirts in. So I thought I would wear it today to give uh, Bjorn, Bjorn yeah. a thrill. And uh, he sent us shirts for, he's a, he coaches this hockey team, college team. Yeah. And uh, he was saying that, or he sent us a, a nice five paragraph or five page essay on why we're the best. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> it was great. So Super nice. uh, we got to sit and read it, uh, which was great. He was kind of just talking about like the impact we've had uh, on him and his team. And that's the great shit. That we get to experience when yeah. we're with our members, when we start talking to you guys and get to know each other and stuff like that. So, uh, I don't know if you want to throw. A, look, you look like you have two cents to add on that. No, I wasn't. You know I mean? I'm just. It's very oh, okay. nice. It was very nice. Um, very nice. It was sincere, right? Like uh, that's it. It's the sincere, it was just so genuine. sincere, and and we've helped him and his team out in many ways, I guess. And it's very nice. I just, yep. That's all I got to say. Okay. You had you have the posture like you have something to say. That's why. I said oh that. no, I was just thinking about what I I wanted to talk about next. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, one second. Yeah. I so know. just <clears throat> on that, uh, thanks for the shirt first of all because the shirts are great, and uh, we're starting to get. We had another member that um, had another like hockey company reach out to us to connect and stuff like that. So that's another thing that's happening through like membership. So it's really cool. Like I've said before we get to know some of you guys and we start to develop some relationships. And then next thing you know, we're talking to, you know, coaches of college teams or we're talking to people that run the hockey type companies and stuff like that, which is super, super cool. So um, with, with all that kind of said, if you guys want, want to do that and be members, man, like it's real, it's a really cool thing to be a part of as it like turn, starts to turn into like a more of a community type thing. Um, Cause now we've got, it's literally all over. It's like, there's people from everywhere that are doing it. So um if if not anything else, like just supporting us is awesome. But then if you take advantage of that, um, where we can start to talk to some of you guys, it's really it, it is a great thing. So if if uh, it is within your means to do that, please you can go to the you can go to the uh, PowerTech website or in the description of the videos, and the memberships are there, man, which is a really cool thing. Um, your thing. Well, I got a couple, but I was just re reminding myself because um, behind you, you have all the blue star stuff. Yeah, you like my leaning tower here. Yeah, it's I'm gonna good. keep getting creative with the stack <laughs> in the back here. So. Yeah, but it's good. Anyways, there's another. That's another membership uh, connection. Oh yeah, that that's right. You're you know, on the weekend, actually, yeah. Yeah, um, well, that that person has been to a couple of uh, Charlie's games and stuff, and I communicate with him quite a bit, and. Uh, pretty awesome like I, I i like their the supplements a lot and actually when i was in guelph this weekend uh charlie's fitness uh or their athletic coach what do you call him strength coach um told him like for sleep and stuff and recovery get some stuff so i called our contacts and 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 funny enough they had not funny enough but they have their uh a, an unbelievable gym in uh, guelph it's called uh, uh project iron so he said just go there and then get your membership and all that stuff. So like we get to my wife and I and you, if you go to Guelph, get to go there and work out. What a gym. So anyway, Cheryl that was there was so nice. Said this is what my son's looking for. Said here, 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 here. There you go. Oh, good stuff, eh? Just mostly for getting good sleep and recovery. So nice. So nice. But uh I can't wait to work out there. I couldn't do it this weekend, but that next week I'm going to take a couple of runs at it. And uh, what, it was the coolest gym ever. Like, it's so different than ours. Like, ours is like a hockey gym. Theirs is like, um, um, you know, it's designed nice. Like a studio stuff. gym kind of thing? Studio. But, do, don't, do they shoot like their Yeah, they do all their commercials yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. like that there. And it's not like Like uh, all whatever. the Blue Star ads and whatever right. are at that gym. Yeah. Right. But I would, like anybody in Guelph, man, unbelievable gym. Like, yeah. unbelievable. It's... Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say. No, that's was, this is the cool shit, man. That's what yeah. I'm saying. It's like this yeah. is these are things that when we started doing this, I never thought like these kind of opportunities. Like I thought there'd be I thought it would be more like transactional, like it'd be more business stuff, but it's it's a lot more just like we're becoming friends with people and like people do different things and then we start to get involved with stuff they're doing and it's it's really interesting to to network and see uh all these different things that are going on and it's like all over the United States of America, Canada, and then even like in the in the summertime we had I I don't know if I've mentioned this on the podcast I think we did we had a guy from Norway here training because of the podcast it's just crazy man so 
it's uh it's really interesting so yeah anyways that stuff uh it's on the it's on the website i keep the links in the bio in the description and stuff like that so if you guys are interested in doing that please it's it's super helpful and it just keeps the the message going if you guys like what what we're doing here so uh so that's cool uh do you have any other bs before well, we yeah start? yeah okay. so just scotty was here from the arena mm -hmm. we were shooting the shit and i saw his logo on his uh on his hat he's wearing a yeah, chicago yeah, blackhawks yeah, Black Hawks, yeah. logo what a logo great logo isn't that nice it is nice we were talking about uh i think it was charlie and i a couple of weeks ago talking about colors if you if you started a franchise what color scheme would you go with so i'm gonna ask you what would you go with did you ever think of colors it? yeah like that um, chicago stands out detroit stands out De toronto was simple but stands out montreal some people love it what, what, what do you like see i don't i don't on the one hand i like the if there's one like big contrast color like if you look at the seattle they have that light blue where it's like really so on the one hand i like that but then on the other hand i also like the subtle like old school style um color schemes so i don't i don't know what particular colors i would pick like i'm i'm uh defaulting to something like powertech logos just because powertech but i don't think i have a good answer in terms of the colors but my follow-up question to you you can answer the color scheme thing but my follow-up question to you would be like do you prefer uh like some kind of image based or like symbol logo or do you like like the college like umass or like when yeah. it's not an actual it's a logo question. it's just the word like yeah. which do you prefer i like as a third jersey or a like a once in a alternate, while jersey yeah. alternate jersey I, I don't mind the just the lettering or the yeah name, but i do like a good logo mm -hmm. Like there's, it's so classic, right? Yeah, I think it, I like logos that are classic, like the symbol ones that are classic. But then I like the, I like college style. Like I loved in, in when I was playing, like it was just like Windsor, you know. We go up, be like Carlton, be like there's no, there's no, th it's just the name of the school or whatever. I love that in college, and the jerseys are all super simple. You don't got like weird stripes going everywhere and whatever. It's just like couple lines, plain. It's like styled simple on purpose. I kind of like that yeah. kind of thing. The yeah. Jerseys. I like Boston's right now. They have a they they they're doing a not retro but an anniversary. I, I I'm, I'm I, the reason it's in front of me so much because of uh, Potsy right on our team, and uh, he's up there right now and could be there for the year. Um, it's just it's a really clean, nice looking black gold. I can't. And white. I don't know which one it is. Yeah, I'll show you after. You will like it? Yeah. It's clean. Is it the bear on it or what is it? No, just a B. Just the the B, the B oh. with the hub and stuff. But the, yeah. the 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 striping stuff is just really nice. You, you probably wouldn't even know the difference, but it's just nice and clean crisp um chicago for sure like that's just nice so i'm like if we go back to the colors um black is easy to integrate but like i do like a lot of black in my stuff because it's crisp but like i and i think i would default to a red i like the guelph crimson I, re I really like that um and then my other color that i've always had a liking to i guess if that's the word would be the best I could come up with is uh, Maine U U University. Of it's the navy, but that baby blue or whatever. Yeah, navy, baby I, blue. For some reason, I really like that baby blue compliment. That's exactly what I was saying with Seattle. Same color. Oh, okay. It's the exact same color. That light blue. Yeah. Yeah. Like, remember St. Mike's Majors had yep. it? Exactly. That, I really like that yeah. color screen. It's, it shoots out at you. So, yeah. on a side, side tangent with the colors, is uh, I learned that if anybody knows the nutrition company Quest, yeah, I think I don't know if it's Tom Bill, uh, Billiu or Bailu or That's whatever that name, he yeah. started it. Yeah, I don't know if he started Quest or he was part of starting was it or something. Part of it, yeah. And I think he's out. I don't know if he's still in it now. I don't know if he I think sold he it sold or whatever. It for three hundred billion yeah, dollars or something. Yeah, but he. Uh, I remember him talking. I listened to an interview with him talking about, or it was in a book. I think it was in a book actually. They were talking about how they came up with the color scheme, and they were studying what the most positive color association is, and that's why they came up with that blue. And that they have in the Quest logo because that blue was like one of the most positively associated. Just like us, just we both happened to pick it, and that like goes with like research they did on what people associate with certain colors. And then red is another one. Red is like that sexy color, like you, having like a red hot rod car, like those kind of things. So it's funny how like the colors. And yellow's play. in there too, right? I don't know. I, I, I just so. know the blue was, and I know the red is like known yeah. to be that kind of like yeah. stylish color, whatever. But uh, it's funny how it plays. Yeah, I think I read from a marketing marketing standpoint the red and yellow and it could be the blue but i know the red and yellow are musts if you want to have a, a logo really think of mcdonald's burger king yeah is there anything be else? in there kind of thing yeah, yeah. interesting yeah 
Very cool. That's all I got for no, that. No, that's cool. <laughs> good, good, uh, it's good warm up. Hey guys, my name is David. For the last roughly year or so, I've been a member of the PowerTech podcast and I've trusted Eric and Andy to help me as a hockey dad raising my kids and trying to figure out the answers. I don't have all the answers and it's a great source of information and it's a, an area where I feel comfortable leaning on to help me make better decisions. With that said, one thing I do know about is supplements. I find it's hard to navigate the whole supplement world and make sure that you're using products that work, that are effective, and again, are science research based. Blue Star products, incredible brand. The products are based on research, science, the products work, trademark patent ingredients, and you can find all of the research just by scanning QR codes that are right on the back of the product. Thank you to Eric and Andy for their podcast. I think it's amazing and definitely give Blue Star Products a try. Uh, so today I want to talk about, uh, I want to go back to roles and talk about developing roles today because it's something that we talk about a lot and, and same thing. I'm still like trying to catch up on all these DMs and messages I'm getting and it seems to be a, a theme of people being unsure like they understand the concept of what a role is, but then it, when it comes to specific skills and specific skill sets, it's like if I if we throw out a word like a power forward, a stay at home defenseman, whatever, what skills make those roles? Like what makes you one of those things? And it seems like again, sitting here just putting the episode together, I was like, seems obvious to me. Like it's not that hard to figure out. But that's again us being right in the world all the time. So I think it would be, it's, it's a helpful thing maybe, or hopefully it's a helpful thing where we can kind of walk through from, from the ground up kind of again, like just the idea of roles and when that starts to happen in hockey, why it's important. And then we can kind of get into some of the, the nitty gritty of like actual skills, because then like my, my favorite thing to do when we do the podcast is giving people like an action, like an actionable thing. Because when we talk like all vague, it's like hard to know, like, how do I apply this thing to my situation? So I like giving like concrete stuff. So maybe we'll finish off like talking about the actual skills and how to turn it into this role type of thing. Uh, so if, I don't know if you want to start um, just talking about in general, like general thoughts about uh, roles, when they're appropriate, how to develop into it, like that kind of stuff. Is that, is that enough? Yeah. Does that make sense? Well, I think, I think uh, why roles are important. Like, first of all, um, I think sometimes roles can be um, perceived as a negative or, or an extreme positive. For example, if, and, and this is what, you know, this is what people, I think players should try to, and parents actually, especially when kids are young. For, let me go first of all, first of all, first of all, roles are not, we're, we're not talking about seven-year-olds. We're talking about at a certain age, at a certain level, roles become important when it comes become when you decide to, that you want to start winning games and be a competitive hockey team and you know you're pursuing hockey right so but the other so the next thing would be that roles can be perceived as negative or extremely positive so i want i think a lot of the times how a parent reacts to maybe a, a, how their child has been given a role that can be negative like if you say to someone like you're a shut down centerman and the kids score goals, like let's say you're a junior guy or 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 Bantam, whatever, and all of a sudden you're going to be more of a defensive player. People could say, "Well, I can score goals," though. and it's like a negative. And it's like like I, I want I, I I'm hoping that kids and parents can see the value of of not being negative about it and seeing the value of it, and then uh, and then. That's that's that because there's there's a lot of good things about roles and then the next thing about that is like just because you have your your inner role because sometimes coaches make mistakes or they see one thing and and do an, and they see one thing and they put you in a role where it's not really your thing but they, maybe it'll get fixed maybe it won't but still I would still say embrace it because you're just learning about hockey right um, but even having said that because you're a goal scorer doesn't Let's say, right? You say you're an offensive player, goal scorer. That doesn't limit you from only scoring goals. And I think, I think putting labels on people, and that's what you try not to do when you do roles. When you put labels on people, that's where it could get um, um, maybe someone could have hurt feelings, yeah. right? So I would make sure that you, and being a shutdown guy doesn't mean that you can never score a goal or you're not important to the team, right? It's, it's, that's what I have to say before I start. Yeah. Okay. A couple things about that. First would be, if you can, can you pin it? This could be a one word answer. Can you pin it to like an age of where it starts to be relevant? Like at what point? Almost should you start, an age. What point should you start paying attention to like, what am, what am I best designed for as a player kind of thing? Yeah. 
So obviously not when you start mm-hmm. because people have to play hockey. Right. Like and you need they, time to figure out what you're good at kind of thing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and then I would even say there's a certain level and, and it's arbitrary. Like there's no definitive answer to that. Good word. Huh? Um, so first of all, you, as, as coaches and parents, as players, you just want to play and you want to figure out what you are. Right. And, and there's no point in teaching. Uh, there's always a point in getting the message out of working hard and moving the puck. Like those little things are things that we, those are non-negotiables basically, but to have roles, uh, uh, even a 10 year old, 11 year old, 12 year old, that, that maybe not yet. Right. Because let, let's just go play hockey. Cause a lot of times things sort itself out. So, so if you're playing house league hockey and you're 15, does it matter if you're a shutdown forward or not? Like, I don't think so. But if you're playing on a triple A team or a double A team, like you're and you're and you're at a, a level where there's body checking and you know, you're, maybe you're trying to win championships and stuff like that, then winning becomes maybe a little bit more important than that kind of sorts itself out. So I would say if I'm doing just a general statement, probably around the U14, I'm being very general. That could change because you could have the best team in the world with guys that get it early and you want to win in the U11 thing and and you can do it and it works. That's fine. But I think generally... You want your kids to play hockey. The aggressive players will be aggressive. You, you, um, kids that are more defensive will kind of be more on the defensive side. And I think it's just important to let them play and teach them the non-negotiables of hockey. Yeah, because you need some time to figure everything out, right? So I, I think I think the one thing, it's funny too, because like some people that hear this, you know, it's, I don't, I'm not trying to like pick on parents and stuff like that, but I find, I've said this before, I find the younger the player, the more seriously parents talk about this kind of stuff, which is really strange to me. Like, I feel like the older they get, the more serious they should take it. But it seems like when kids are younger, maybe it's because parents don't see like the vastness of the hockey world and like how many good players there are out there. So you see like your kid has a little bit of ability. They get excited. They want to start jumping on some of these things like, okay, how can I now best develop my kid's role when he's 10 or get him in an off ice program or this and that and that like that. I see it more younger, which is weird, but it, I mean, it still happens older too, but I'm, it's more apparent to me when kids are younger that they get crazy about stuff like this. The reason I'm saying that is there's a way to start to introduce these concepts without it being like, you need to know your role, kid, when you're 11. So one, just one quick example is funny because I had the, the one class in here today. We're doing like intro weightlifting stuff. And you know how much they care about weightlifting? They don't at all. They're grade sevens. So I need to teach it to them though, and I want them to learn it. But every five minutes today, I had kids saying, can I go on the assault bike? Yeah, just to piss just around. To piss around, right? So yeah. it's like they can only take so much yeah. is my point of that yeah. at that age when they're young. So in those kids, I don't even know what grade seven is, maybe 12, 11, something like that. So yeah, 10, it's 11, around there, 11, right? Yeah. So it's this, that's the age where it's like, you, they can't, they can only take so much, man, you know? So that's my one thing about, about the rules. And then the other thing is what the idea you kind of t- touched on it a bit of like putting boundaries on people or putting labels where now you're sticking a kid to a role. And that's the other danger that you can kind of fall into especially the younger they are so if you're a coach listening to this you're like okay i need to establish roles on my team it's like yes but like everyone still needs to play and experience everything to develop right so that's kind of why i like that that u14 ish kind of area because i feel like you've been playing if you're playing at a high level if you're pursuing hockey like with all those caveats again i feel like you've been playing long enough to kind of see where you lie on this like skill spectrum that we're going to run through and then maybe which direction you're going to be more going towards, which can still change. Yeah. It's not well, like you're and, still and stuck. I, th- I think, I think like even saying all that, like I know I might be going backwards there, even saying all that, like the, the term role for U14 might even be early. And, and here's what I mean by that. Okay. So, and, and maybe, maybe even U16 might be a little bit early, but not, but hang, hang in there. Okay. Because in youth hockey, you typically have three lines and, three sets of D, right? And one goalie or two goalies. So you don't necessarily, you can, you can, if you're you're building, like if you're the triple A wanting to get drafted, double A that you're really competitive and you're trying to win games, 
and I know that might sound like a weird statement. You're trying to win games. There's like there's competitive hockey that that's expected, and then there's more of a fun hockey where it's not as expected. It's about keeping kids playing hockey, right, and enjoying it. Um, so even so, if you take a because I've I've had this with my uh, Bantam team when I was in Detroit, it was like everybody was so good. Everybody thought they were a first line guy. So roles could also be not necessarily you're a checker, you're a this, you're a that. It's just like you can, what you could do is you take roles and you can complement line mates or complement a team. So it doesn't have to be said your role is, right? But it, but it can be. Right. Yeah, I know that's ambiguous. But no, but I think I think it's the, the point is like you're, you're starting to introduce the idea of like some players are better at certain things than others, right? And you don't necessarily have to call that a role, but it's like if you got the kid that's really fast, it's like everyone can see that. If you got the kid that can really shoot, like everyone can see that. If you got the guy that's just bigger and he can out muscle guys and whatever, all the parents, all the players, everybody can see obvious strengths that players have. And they can also see like obvious weaknesses that players have. And so as a coach or as a parent, and then understanding it as a player, I feel like it's important that around that time, whether you call it a role or not, or you stick someone to a role or you don't, it's just important that there starts to be an understanding that these things exist. Like you need to understand that moving forward, this is where it's going. Like there's a reason why the guy that's the third, like what's, I'm trying to think of a good fourth line example in the NHL that people would know, like a Cal Clutterbuck or like a, a Matt Martin, they, they're on that checking line. Like there's a reason they're always on the fourth line because that is a, a staple role in the NHL. So it's just like teaching or starting to introduce that idea of like, this is where it goes. Like you guys can see where this goes, right? So whether or not you're sticking it to them or saying roll or whatever, I think it's just making kids understand like later on, this is what's going to be coming. If that yeah. kind of makes sense. Yeah. And the, the only other reason I would say like, it's still a little bit early still, like when they're in youth hockey, because, and I don't mean this in any disrespectful or uh, rude way, but like some kids are still so immature and 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 even the environment like the the parents telling them or grandparents saying you did, did you score did you score a lot of people put importance on scoring so i've seen seen this in youth hockey where you know the kids just trying so hard to score that he forgets about everything else and you know he might not score still right and he just gets frustrated so it's like it's important now having said all that stuff it goes oh, to me it always goes back to if you're going to put labels or rules on people one way that will get them around to believing or understanding it is if you have a really good explanation of why you see this or, and, and why if you do this job, it's going to help the team and why if you do this job, it's going to help you as a player. So if you can do a really good job at that without, you know, minimizing a, and, and making, actually, I don't mean it to say it like that either, is, is to make every role very, very important because it actually is. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, okay, so I want to start going through like some of the actual skills now. Well, yeah, there was there was something that you asked me to do, and I did. I'll do this real quick first. Yeah, sure. it, it was it was like, why are they important? Why are roles important? Yeah, yeah go ahead. So I, I just I put a couple things down. Like, and, I mean, it's, I'm stating the obvious here, but maybe not. But roles are important is because teams are made out of many components, right? So especially as you get older, not everybody can score, and not everybody can just be defenders. If you have all goal scorers, then you know, that's one thing. If you have people that only want to defend, then you don't put pucks in the net, right? So that's that. So it's like, obviously, um, if you have people doing certain jobs, just like in any business, it, it, you just have better outcomes, right? Um, it allows a team to play in different ways, right? It brings different elements to a game and to a team. So again, if we have everybody that's just a goal scorer that wants to put pucks in the net, well, maybe... Maybe it's the type of goal scorers that don't move the puck ever, or maybe they pass too much, or you, they couldn't. Uh, everyone's going to the net trying to score, and they can't defend, and vice versa. If you just always defend, and you can't get pucks to the net, then you, you don't win games that way, right? Um, and then roles help people complement each other. So having a good passer with a shooter and with a checker on that line, that might be the combination that this team that that your team needs, or you have a line that you have a goal scoring line. And then you could complement that with a shutdown line or a checking line and stuff like that, more or less. It kind of gives you different flavors for the team, right? So on, on the player side, it gives a player um, uh, a sense of uh, importance on a team. So this is, and I think this is important where roles are actually very important because as I said before, I've had kids on my team that were, they just couldn't think the game. 
So if I if I put them into a like call it a role, and have them think too much, like I, I would I, I I gave him a role, but it wasn't like a traditional role. I said go chase the puck, just get the puck out this to this guy, right? Like you're giving him roles, but if I just say go chase the puck, don't worry about goals and stuff like that. That's your role. That might be insulting. But if I tell this eight or ten year old. To be effective on our team, you do such a good job hound dogging pucks and putting pressure on D that you, when you do that, our team is a much better player. Go get him, Tiger. <laughs> then he takes a sense of pride in that. It's like, oh, I did my job, right? So giving people roles, and if they you explain the why, and you and you show them that it's very very important that we have this on our team, and if you you know you doing that makes our team better, kids are more willing to do that typically. And they feel very important doing it. So that's why I always said with my teams, like I was never a real big praiser of the offensive goal scoring guy. I was always more about the secondary things that the habits of hockey, the back check, the blocking shots, getting the little things so that kids that, because guys that score 25, 30 goals, 40 goals, 50 goals, everyone pats them on the back. That's what people see. It's the little things that other people don't see that are really important to kids. So it's more like habit based. So then if you could take their habits, put it into a role ish, then you got a kid that feels very good about himself and he feels like he's contributed, even mm-hmm. though he didn't get 30 goals that year. Right. That's, uh, I think one way to, that I remember I talked to one, uh, I was talking to one NHL scout about it. He was talking to me about a player and he was saying that, uh, his details are so good. Like he wasn't, and this is a very offensive player. He wasn't saying this guy's can score. Man, can he shoot? Man, can he make a great pass? The way he framed it, I like that word for it. Is like his details are good, and that's kind of I think another way of saying the same thing you're saying is just like it's those little things, those secondary things that might go unnoticed to the untrained eye, but for people that know hockey and watch hockey, it's like he can just do little things well. You know, and I, that's a that's a, a nice way to to, uh, to well, frame it. And, and and I would say on top of that, like, and I, I put this down in my notes here is, um, that's what I would say. It, that's why it's so important. Like, you'll see kids get caught up. Like, the game catches up to them if they don't have the good details. The games catch up because there are only so many Alexander Ovechkins that can just shoot and put the puck in the net, right? There's only so so many guys that can play. Anything like a Connor McDavid, a Sidney Crosby, like those high, high, or even the best power forward. There's only so many guys that can actually do that job real well. So when you look at guys, and, and, and for an example, if you look at Steve Eiserman, like the kids don't really remember him too much, but if you look at Steve Eiserman when he played, he was an offensive player that was really good. And I don't know this firsthand, but this is how the story goes, is that at some point, Scotty Bowman came in and really tightened up his defensive game. And I don't think he had any reluctance to it. Maybe he did. But he, as his he, being an incredible player already, when he tightened up his defensive game, that's when they won their championships. And that's when he was like a star. And if you even look at Connor McDavid, his first couple of years in the league, he was an offensive, like just unbelievable. But not that there was a knock, but the little bit of a knock was like, maybe he's not the best in his own end. And as that got better, he became better and the teams become better. And if you look around the league, your best offensive players, when they learn how to play both sides of the puck, they become really, really good players. So I said all that to say, before roles are giving, that's what I, given, that's what I'm saying about the non-negotiables. As a, as a player or as a coach, when you're, when you're, coaching your team the non-negotiable should be you know whatever system to a certain degree but executing at the highest level that you can with hard work at both ends of the ice so when you understand from an early age that when you back check there's back checking that looks like you're trying a little bit but then there's back checking that where you actually want to recover cut pucks and then there's defensive zone like i always say to players is when you're trying to score goals and you put pressure on guys, there's a, there's a, a you can see it visually how hard guys work to try to put the puck in the net and forecheck. And a lot of times you come to your own end, you don't see that same passion, that same hard work, and that same intense intensity. So 
teaching those little details makes you a better player early. So now even so having that, those non-negotiables, like actually working on your face offs and trying to win, right. Doing those little things and creating that habit. Now when the roles come, you're like a bet, just a better player all around. So whether you're a goal scorer or a defensive shutdown guy, you have pride in doing the little things and that's what makes the best players possible. And that's what help teams win. And I, I, I noticed the biggest thing, the biggest difference is to me, and obviously because there's glory in scoring and there's not as much as just defending okay. Because you don't see, you know, people don't jump out of their seats when a guy steals a puck and turns it up the ice. You know what I mean? So long story. Yeah. No, no, but, but well, the funny thing about that part just on the tail end there is that normally with your team, maybe not with the fans, but with your team, that's where you get the praise. You know, like your teammates notice that like everybody loves the guy on the team that will eat the shots and is like winning face offs and back checks hard. Like everybody on the team feeds off that, even if maybe the fans don't as much because they don't appreciate kind of what that does for the team. But the only other thing I was going to add is this is just another people will lo- like this example because everybody likes the movie Miracle. Right. And like that, the famous like Herb Brooks line of I'm not looking for the best players. I'm looking for the right ones kind of is the same because i don't even know the story the miracles i don't know if that's even accurate the way the movie went i don't think it necessarily is but uh that line of like looking for the right guys is kind of points to the same thing where it's like you're not always looking for all just straight firepower up front because a lot of times i've been on teams like that where it just doesn't work man or they'll like win the league but you get into the first round of the playoffs and like these guys disappear, right? I, I would argue a little bit of that with the Spitfires last year, right? They got all this firepower up front. As soon as the game started getting hard, it's like now these guys aren't, maybe they weren't the horses that you thought they were when yeah. things get hard, right? So I yeah. think that that's well, the only, happens a lot. Yeah, that's the only thing I'll add. Happens maybe a that a lot of teams do that, right? Yeah, for yeah, sure. 100%. Uh, so I think this is kind of what I want to do. If you have a better way or you want to change it up a little bit, you just tell me. Um, I kind of want to just go through just the like skills that we're going to be talking about. So where I'm going with this is when we say what, like a certain role, when we say one of them, I want to be able to give people the, the tools to know what makes that kind of player. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'll give it a step. So I want to just first start by just listing some of the skills that you'll typically associate with each position. And then I'm going to try to mention, and you can try to uh, NHL player, like a well-known player that's good at each of these skills. Right. So obviously, like if we start with forwards, the first one I have down here is just a good shooter. Someone who's a good shooter. That's like your Ovechkin guy. Right. So this is this is your guy where it doesn't matter what happens. He just seems to be the guy that can score the goal. He can just shoot the puck. Right. That's that's uh, my first one. I'm going to keep ripping. Just interrupt me if you want to say something. Yeah. Okay. We're going to probably touch on this sort of later. Yeah. Oh, yeah okay. A little bit. Okay. So for a shooter, that's kind of the guy or the type of player. So if you're looking for a shooter, like this is the guy that you're looking for where maybe he's not doing a lot of work, but as soon as he gets it on a stick, he just needs one shot, right? Or he just needs two shots a game and he'll get a goal. Right. And I remember playing with guys like that where, where I needed five or six shots to get a goal. There's other guys I play where they needed two. And that was like the shooter guy. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people might think like just from a skills standpoint that, okay, practice my shot. Yes. But there's more to it than be, to being a good shooter than just having a good hard shot. Cause I've seen a lot of guys that have really good shots and maybe even accurate, but maybe the, they take too much time to release the shot. They telegraph the shot. They don't get in good lanes. They don't change angles and, or, 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 or yeah, or they, so it's not just being able to shoot it's be able to know what you're doing, when to shoot, how to shoot, changing angles. There's more to it than just having a good shot because if that was the case, the hardest shot would win. This, that's exactly where I wanted you to go with that because the the best example I have is like the guy that it's the it's on the power play and they peel down the wing and try to rip one high glove and it goes over the net and rims out, break out for the other team or there's 15 seconds off the clock for the other team now, right? It's like, okay, even if you have a great shot, that's a bad decision. So it's like that contributes to whether or not you're being you're a good shooter. You know, and that's a that's a very good way to lay that out, right? It's not just the skill; it's the decision making, the timeliness of when you're doing the shot versus not. You know, maybe you can go bar down, but maybe you know how to put it right off the pad where it's like a shot pass or yeah. something like that. You yeah. know, so that that all contributes. Just knowing, to that. you know, if if the puck comes across the ice to me here, 
how goalies move across the ice. So are they leaving the top of the net open, the bottom of the net open? Are they leaving the far side open? So it's it's knowing and anticipating those things, knowing your goalie. So it's like there's a lot more than just having a good shot. And of, of with all of the things I'm going to say, that same frame applies to all these things. Like Because the next time I was going to go to is stick handling. The one for me, I go to like the real slick guys it was a Pavel Datsuk. I don't know if there's a, is there a modern player that's would be like that well let's comparable i don't know would you consider mcdavid would you yeah yeah, would yeah. You, would yeah. You, there would you go you, would yeah you, that's fine would you consider uh mckinnon i'm trying to find i'm trying to think of like a guy where Barzal? it's like it's like in isolation almost yeah I, i'm where they're the not as complete like like because connor it's like he's what a great stick handler but he's also a really great skater and he's also a really that good this where it's like Ovechkin to me, it's just like the guy shoots. Like that's all I think of when I think of him. I don't think of everything as amazing. Kaprizov. There you go. There's Minnesota. One, right? There's just a slick, slick, right? Slick. Um, and and with that, it's still the same frame you're just saying. It's like it's not just that they have fast hands. Well, right? so I'll say this. I'll say this forever, right? I I actually think when people see that and they see a lot of the toys and implements that are put on the ice and the the cones and stuff like that, where people do stick handling drills with their head down and not being taught to scan and not having any pressure against them. I think people are fooled. I think in my opinion, the best skilled guys don't use that stuff. Well, now you're going to say, well, McDavid did all his life. Yes, he did use pep all his life. This is true, but I, I guarantee he did it through pressure situations. But I, I think that too many people are doing too much of that and they're not learning how to apply the skill within a game. So, in fact, I, I was telling you about one kid that I watched on the weekend that he has skill, kind of. Like, he skates beautifully. He's got good hands and a great shot. Remember I told you he came out and he looked like he was making a rush, but he went into four guys and it was like, it was good up until that point and knocked away and it's two on one back. It happened a couple of times. It's like, so there's to me is a person that skated through pylons and you think like, I don't know if you think you just get lucky or you should just be able to make these moves through people, but it doesn't work, man, because he didn't add resistance or he didn't add yeah. like real the game real situations. Yeah. So it's good to have the stick handling hands, but you have to know how to apply it. Yeah. Right, so a good example of that for me, if I go to a guy like Kucherov, oh my god, where okay, so so he's not like the chicky chicky guy. Only when he has to only be. Only when he has to be, yeah. right? And I would argue he's right up there with one, oh, as one of the best puck handlers in the league. But he he can hold on, like he identifies when to do the quick and then when to just hang on and not do one stick handle, or when to not dust the puck off and just get it and move it right away. Like that is all stick handling to me, you know. So those are the kinds of guys I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, if we go to a passer, me, I'm Crosby all day, where this guy can throw a backhand pass on the tape, blue line to blue line. Um, and it's it's same thing. It's the same decision-making process. He can apply it in the game. He can see, like, when do I hold it for an extra second and then make the pass? When do I use my backhand versus my forehand? When do I open up? When do I sauce? When do I th – th this kind of player. Yeah. Um, Mitch Marner's very good at it. Yeah, Marner, great. Very good. Really, really, really good at it. Um, great skater, obviously McDavid is one where he's just awesome. Uh, McKinnon, just like powerful. Kale McCarr, just like a good. He's on a D, but same thing. Good skater. Uh, hitting or forechecking. So I I don't know. I can't think of a guy who, um, off the top of my head, where it's like they're just a really good forechecker. Yeah, I got in the it. NHL. You got one? Who do you got? Cool, cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I got I got lots. I mean, good forecheckers. Or guys like Tom Wills, like, like your typical power. Yeah, player. that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, but but uh, Zach Hyman, there you go. Really good. I, I was my point. I was gonna say I'm trying to find one that isn't like necessarily the guy that crushes guys too, but because there's guys that are just really good at forcing plays without necessarily being the heavy hitter. But I didn't I didn't really have an example of that because I was gonna say like Tom Wilson, whatever yeah. as the Zach Hyman's good. Guy. Hyman, yeah, yeah. Um, good faceoff guy. Bergeron was always this for me. To last year where he could just win a draw no matter what just knew how to read you knew how to read the game i don't know of a better example because he's still pretty new because he just he just retired but i don't know if there's another guy carbono old school he carbono yeah crosby is another one worked on his face off like that's really good at it but you can i mean with all these stats too you could go on the on the nhl thing and look at face off wins or whatever right um something like offensive or defensive awareness so for me this would be 
uh, McDavid's an obvious example, but Dry Sidle's another Seidel. great one, right? He would be good for passing too, but just just knows where to be without looking like he's working hard. You know, just in the right spot. Uh, that Matthews kind of player, is very smart with that. Yeah, Matthews is good very, with that too. He knows how to find yeah. holes. Yep. Just general positional play too. Just being in the right area, just like to disrupt plays, whether that's offensively or defensively. Um, if we go to D now, like guy guy with a good first pass. So I don't even know. I can't even think of a one off the top well, of my head. Where most, it's like most, first, most, most are. are. That's what I was going to say. Most kind are. of a requirement, right? Good first pass. Uh, shot blocking. Guys, that, I think of Webby when I think of that guy. Oh, just, I know. A guy that'll just eat him from anywhere yeah. and not care. Yeah, I have him my stay home D. That's uh, I always include uh, a guy like uh, Ryan McDonough. Just yeah, eats McDonough, bucks. absolutely. Ian absolutely. Cole. Ian Cole. I remember Ian Cole. Oh, I forgot about him. Um, good skater. Kale McCarr. Good like hockey IQ guy. Or offensive, defensive awareness. I think of a guy like Hedman, shooting, same thing. Um, so with all these skills, that's on the ice. Then we have things on the bench too. Where like you got the vocal guy or you got the lead by example guy, the quiet guy, whatever, the good communicator person. So all of these things, and there's more. My point of bringing these up is just to give people an idea of all of the different areas where your kid or if you're the player listening or a coach, like these are specific skills that you can identify as kids being particularly strong at right and then when we start talking about roles now it's going to be the combination of some of these things are what make you better suited to a certain role if that all kind of makes sense so if i go to the actual roles the the first one and your favorite is if we go for, to a, a power forward so i want to talk a little bit about you can use an example of power forwards if you want to but just like what are this what is the skill set that you would identify as the power forward? Like, what do they, what do they need? Cause I feel like people think of power forward, like hit right for check, which is part. But yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So for power forward, like it's, a, it's an exciting position. Uh, I, I love it. It's, it's probably my favorite because it, it, it requires so many skills and it's not necessarily uh, the glamor role, but done well, it is right. You get a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the times if you look at a power forward, they're the guys that do the work behind the scenes. You know, they're the, they're the, the guy that paved the road for the, for the goal scorers and stuff like that. Right. But like, and so in a nutshell for me, if I was to pick two off the top of my head, I would have said like, well, old school, I, I, I like a guy like Brendan Shanahan. So you could see like something. Oh yeah. He's like modern day power forward right like really good big now you don't have to be big but typically you are bigger uh you skate well you can skate really well or you can you can maybe lumber a little bit but the point is you get to places and you get there usually not not you don't have to get there violently but that's it's kind of like a thing the threats there yeah because you're you're in those situations right so i was just saying power forward i wrote a couple things down it's like typically physical right Typically has enough speed, right, and and uh, plays in straighter lines. So what what I mean by that is you're not trying to dipsy doodle around people and stuff. So if I'm coming on a one on one with you, uh, if I can if I don't have a play, which because they, they you usually can make plays, like a good NHL one can make a play, but if the plays aren't there, they're gonna not try to beat you one on one. What they're probably gonna do is they're gonna chip it by you, and they're gonna use their speed or their power to get in front of you or and if, if they can't get in front of you to run you over and then work hard in the corners and do the, the hard work. You're going to probably go to the net a lot and they're going to back check hard, right? So they're, um, they go through traffic a lot. They go through people, get pucks deep. They, they create the, create the havoc. That's what it is. And typically they shoot off the wings, like never a bad shot. Right. And they just take like pucks getting, to the net. throwing stuff to the net, getting to the net. Yeah. Shoot. But like, typically everything they do, there's a contact with it. Right. Even D zone is a lot of contact. And then obviously in their own end, they're, you know, they're good against, they're good on the walls everywhere on the ice and they get pucks out. Like, and that doesn't seem like a real important thing, but like uh, on the weekend, one of the goals that Guelph scored, it went off of a big Vilmer Ulrichson. Right. It was a backhand rim, not the hardest rim, but like one of those you go, ah. But he played it so well, right? So he was drafted to the Vancouver Canucks, and he took it. And most most people that are skilled on the wall will take the puck, you know, try to hammer it out, or if they don't have time, it gets usually a shit show. But he had the ability to actually make a play off of it. So, you know, heads up, took it off the wall, knew he was going to get contact, took the contact, slipped it through the middle, centerman two-on-one, or two-on-two, two-on-one with a hard back checker, 
They got the puck out wide, pucks in the back of the net. And a lot of people could say, oh, what a shot. But what you have to look at is he actually took a play that wasn't, you know, it was a um, the D that rimmed it. It may or may not have been his best option. But let's just say put the winger in not the best position, but that play there is what created the goal. The, the shot too, obviously, in the passing it up, but like, but not enough credit goes to that. So like when I looked at that, I said, what a great play. That What a great play that is. So that's what, that's how important your D zone stuff is, right? Yeah. So, so is that good for power forward? Yeah, that's cool. They you, get the, you, con- you get you the t- concept, right? Yeah, you can say more if you want. <laughs> no, nope, no, it's good. good. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's your standard definition of a power forward, I yeah. would say. Yeah. Uh, if we go to like playmaker guy, yeah. Who do you well, got for playmaker, or just like what what are the skills, or who do you got? No, as a no, guy? like at least I, I'm gonna go with uh, a Mitch Marner. So you could say he's a goal scorer too. And yeah, well, a lot of playmakers can score goals because they can make plays. So it, it, being a playmaker, like it's or a good passer, doesn't seem like like what's so hard about it. But what you have to understand is like when you're making plays at high levels. Um, guys defend so hard and so quick and there's contact and what you think is open might not be open. So what you actually to be a good playmaker is you have to, you have to see all the moving parts on the ice. Right. So like I always used to use the uh, analogy when Ryan Ellis played in Windsor is that what everybody else saw when he was, when he would come up the ice to make a play, most guys would see, Oh, there's a play, but he saw there's a play, but there's a, there's a play two zones down that could stretch someone that no one else in the rink would see. They can just see that and they have the ability and the skill to make it. So a lot of the times it comes with deception. Uh, I think a panic threshold is a big thing. Uh, Like you look at uh, Matt Potras with, with Guelph or maybe with Boston, wherever he's going now, you know, piss me off, but I'm happy for him. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, White Johnson would have been like that last year with, with Spitz went up to Dallas. Their panic threshold yeah, when they Kucherov. have that's, that's Kucherov. The Kucherov effect. There you go. Yeah, for the for the rest of the world, yeah, yeah Kucherov and uh, uh, th- their panic threshold is much higher than most people. So what that means is where most people will feel pressure. It's like they feel like I've got to make that play or that pass, and maybe it doesn't work out most of the time, or that pass I'm not sure enough. So what's my safest route is to get it deep, put it behind the net, which is good, but like the elite guys. Potsy, for example, he'll hang on to the puck for 40 seconds and then he makes his play. And there's deception and what you think is there and he peels off or he backs out, creates space. It's There's an intelligence to be in a playmaker, right? They yeah. see things differently. And then the skill level is so high that, you know, it's like you when you watch an NFL game and you watch a quarterback, you know, when they show the replay from behind the quarterback's view and you see a guy going between two, three guys and he's threading that needle and you're like, that's how do you do it? Like that's the quality of what they, they, they know it's going to do it. They're They're putting the puck or the ball exactly this high, this fast, and they can read how fast guys are coming. That's what a playmaker can do. Yeah. It's, it's uh seeing it, like identifying you can do it and then being able to execute it too. That's one thing that was so funny this summer, like playing with when I played in the, on Sundays with these guys, it's like my brain can still see the, the stuff, but I can no longer execute the play anymore like it's starting to go away which is which is both sad and hilarious but when i think about the playmaker guy the the example that i think of is like if you're in a small area and there's a guy between you know it's a two-on-one or something let's say and the guy can if the defenseman is expecting a flat pass they make the sauce if they're expecting the sauce they can make the flat pass and it's like how did you how did you know the one that the defender just wasn't able to read like, how did you know to do that one this time? And that's the that's the playmaking sense, right? That's that ability where you can just execute what needs to be done when it needs to be done and it works, you know? And that's the, a lot of guys don't have that or they'll have half of it where they can see the play but can't execute it or they have the skill to execute it. Maybe more like the guy you were talking about skating up the ice. He can skate, he can stick handle, whatever, but he can't execute the thing because he doesn't he didn't see it. Right, he has the skill to do it, but he doesn't have the brain to do it. You know, so it's like the combination of the, or the intersection of those two things is kind of is interesting. Uh, if we go to offensive defenseman, talk a little bit about that one. It's pretty simple. I mean, you know, an off- offensive defenseman when you see it. I guess most of the time, um, who I would say like Kale McCarr, obviously Rasmus Dahlin, 
um, Carlson. They're, they just put up a ton of points, obviously. What do they do? Well, they obviously skate the puck up. They can skate the puck, and they have a pretty good hands. They can move it as well. Um, when they shoot, they know how to get it to the net because they can get sh- good shot lanes. They can get it off quickly. They put it at the right height where they shoot for rebounds or they shoot for goals as well, but they find those little things there. Uh, shot lanes are really important. You know, a lot of, you see a lot of guys shoot and they just can't get it through or they get blocked. Create, you know, they can create de- deception. They're just offensively gifted and similar to a playmaker, they see things other differently or quicker than other people. Like the games are maybe a little bit slow motion for them. You know, it's not always just skill. And then typically they run a power play. You know, so it's pretty. It's pretty simple. It's like very gifted player that can skate and make plays. Really. Yeah. The other. The, I think the other thing for me is there's always like this time factor that they just understand. Like they know when they have time. Nice. They know when they have time, or they know when to not do the stick handle. You know, because that's a big one that I I always see at all levels too. It's not. It's OHL. It's everything. It's like. They get the puck at the point, and it's just an extra stick handle or an extra, and now they're hitting shin pads. Whereas if they didn't do that extra stick handle, it would have went through or whatever stuff like that. They can just read those things, right? Uh, last one would be like a stay at home, like a stay at home D um, factors or skills or whatever that that you think of when, with with that. Yeah, it's it's uh, I, like I said before, Ryan McDonough probably the one that comes to mind like that. Um, they they basically think D first, right? And maybe it's a function of um, when you get to the NHL level. Um, this is why it's important that you learn how to play your D zone, right? Because even for the fours, I'll go back to the D in a second. Even for the fours that think they're goal scorers, if you don't know how to play your D zone, like the guys, at, at every time you move up levels, the guys are just so much better every single time. So a lot of these guys that are stay-at-home D were, could actually put up some decent points in junior. Like that's forward and D, right? You'd be, you'd be surprised how many guys are on the fourth line or third line in the NHL that had 40 and 50 goal seasons in, in the OHL or, you know what I mean? So stay at home D, they typically think D first. Like like when we look at our wall here, Mike Weber was one that was stay at home D. Got a few, you know, he got some goals in the OHL and stuff, but, you know, second round pick. And this guy would just block shots like crazy. Like it was, it seemed like a simple game. They don't get a ton of glory, but when, when they do, it's usually in the playoffs or they do something amazing. What I always say about a stay, uh, a stay at home D or a good defensive forward is you don't notice them until you notice them. And when you notice them, it's like spectacular. Do you know what I mean? Like you'll see a guy on a back check where, you know, he back checks hard. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he, he, he steals a puck or stops a goal from going in. And it's like amazing because you just appreciate the effort and how hard that might have been to do right and that you just you think all heart and everybody can appreciate that yeah it's, i was and, thinking of the guy that blocks four shots in a row like yeah. you see those highlight videos that they go and eat three yeah. in a row or whatever yeah it's a good example yeah. yeah so like that's what i'm saying about ryan mcdonough and that like the stay-at-home d mike weber and that is that they sacrifice their body for their team like they'll they'll, they'll block shots they'll um they don't do anything really for glory. So they're usually beat up pretty bad. You know, they're playing with broken toes and, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, stuff like it's that. It's a simple but, game. Like, yeah, it, move it. But they think kind of D stuff. first. Yeah. So they're, they're, you're, they're not asked to be carrying the puck all up. You know, the, the, the most that they're really asked to do is make a good first pass. But even then, sometimes it's like, is if, if you can just do your job and get the puck out, move it to your forwards, however that happens, might be good enough. But typically it's a good first pass. Um, Another way to say this, and this would be like a power forward or two, is that they're just really hard to play against. Like every shift against a good defensive player is a pain in the ass. Good defensive defenseman. Because you're probably going to, every time you get near them, there's going to be probably some sort of contact. Whether it's you're going to the net, there's a cross check to your back or to your hips or to your upper upper body, and it's relentless. And you go in the corners and you feel it pretty much every time. They're going to take a piece of you. Uh, and then also... Uh, their sticks are so good that they might not even have to make contact. Like they'll frustrate you that way because their sticks are so good that they have that good range and they take pucks when most like, like take pucks in areas where you never thought you get, um, you get, take, get pucks stolen from you. Uh, usually first good pass, um, get the puck out, block a lot of shots, always boxing all players. 
So, but you usually see these guys on the penalty kills, obviously. And, and in the times of the games where you're protecting leads. So this is where, this is why it's important that people understand roles because if you can, like I said, if you can play good defense and you take real good pride in playing good defensive side, then you get that extra ice when it counts, right? In important minutes. Yeah, for sure. So I think though, like to me, those are like the main four and then maybe there, there's more that you could think of. But the other thing I wanted to point out is like some of these things, they blend, right? So you can have somebody who's not just one of these, but maybe they're all, that's how you kind of get like the complete player type thing. Like the stay at home D that's also offensive or the power forward that also is a playmaker. Like these things can blend, right? Where it's a, a guy like Crosby is a good example of that on the forward side, because it's like, yeah, he's super skilled. He can make plays, whatever, but he can protect pucks. He wins face-offs. He'll block a shot. He makes good outlet passes. Like that's where you start to get that term complete players. Yeah. Like when well, they with Patrice Bergeron, like he wasn't like, I don't, I, I, I didn't, I, I'm saying this out of school, but I don't think he was intimidating as far as like physically. Like, and I mean that, like, he was, but I'm just saying, like, he's not like Ryan Reeves or Kuch, um, not Kucherov, uh, uh, Lucic or something like that, but he's very physical, like, both ends of the ice. He'll win your face off, he'll make the plays, he'll score the goals, he'll back check, Selkie winner, right? So he does, gets the points. So that's a complete blur. Yeah. yeah. So I think that, that's the last thing I wanted to point out about these things. Like, even if there's more, those are kind of like the four big hitters in terms of roles, but then within that, maybe there's more, but they can blend you can be more than just one thing you know and i think that's my my like last thing maybe before i throw it to you to kind of wrap up is like understanding these things doesn't mean that you have to be one of these things only and you have to stay there and set up shop for the rest of your playing career you know it's i think i think it's an important thing especially at at the young younger ages one way maybe to think about it is you should be able to do whichever one of these roles are needed to help your team like that's a good way to think about it so it's like if if you already have three goal scorers like this is a great way or a great way to think about it because if you're you ha always have that inner team competition right like everybody wants to be the top six at the junior levels and above and whatever you want to be the guy that gets the goals and whatever but it's like if you go on a team and you've identified that oh especially at you like you know older levels they already have their top six and they're two years older it's like okay, so how do how am I going to get my ice time then? You know, and now now you can turn on the maybe the more power forward role, and then in two years when oh now I'm the older guy now you can switch a little bit back to the playmaker whatever type of role, and you can fill in the gaps that your team needs filled. You know, and so that's how you start to talk about players that are versatile and they can play in different different situations and why that's so valuable and that's why because like okay I have this one player here where yeah he can score but I can't put him on a kill or I can't do this with him I can't do it. we talk with coaches all the time that they say that about their players it's like yeah he's great with for this but as soon as this happens he's useless or I can't use it or whatever right so just knowing these roles and knowing the skills associated you can start to plug the holes that you could find on your team or if you're a coach and you see a player is better at one than the other you can have them plug that hole and to your point that you said earlier is empower them, make them feel good about it. Give them something to be proud of um, by buying into that role because it helps the team and, and whatever. So I think that that's kind of the main reason I wanted to walk through these things actually like more specifically actually naming what the skills are, because I don't know that it's clear to people what they are because you say power for it. And it was like, I was saying, when we talk about nutrition, right? It's like you say these words, and you hear these terms and the, all the jargon that comes with jargon that comes with uh, <laughs> <laughs> that comes with the 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 sport or whatever whatever subject, and you just take for granted that people just know what they mean, and people kind of know, but not necessarily specifically know. So that's why I think I thought that would be a good kind of exercise to run through today. So uh, that's all I got. Do you want anything else you want to yeah, say? Yeah, just kind of closing. Like um, again, assigning roles does not limit what you can do. It just puts a little bit of. Uh, little bit of structure to your game doesn't limit you so that means if you're a defensive you know shut down defenseman that doesn't mean that if you see ice that you can take and there's no one open or that's the play to make to skate go for it like you know it doesn't limit you like you're a shutdown guy you should never shoot a puck on net you should never stick handle the puck more than a second or whatever now we get to the nhl that might be put on you or the ohl even the less you have the puck the better we're going to be that's not an insult it just is what it is but it doesn't mean you can't do something 
So that that's that'd be the first thing I said. Just keeps your game in check. Um, because one of the worst things, though, like if you don't have rules at certain levels, is when a player thinks he's something, and, and maybe mom and dad at that point, because you know they're talking goals or they're talking whatever, right? I'm, I'm not being negative about it. I'm just saying a lot of times they think they're one thing, but they actually really aren't. So like I'm not even saying to get to the NHL. I'm just saying within that team. I remember in uh, my son my son's playing hockey. You know, when people thought, and I see it today in the OHL, I can see a kid that is a really, really good, like, I'll just use that instead. See a kid that's really, really, really good hockey player that thinks he's something, but he's not. So you got a good, actually pretty complete hockey player that thinks that they're a goal scorer. And that person, you can see their body language. It's like nothing's ever going their way. Or they get frustrated at the things that, because they think they're this, but they're not. Right. So if, if that person would, if that, those people can understand their roles, then they would play, you know, there wouldn't be so much frustration. It's like, good example, man. yeah. So it's yeah. like, I'm not a goal scorer. Like, like I'm, I might not even be a point producer, but I'm, I'm so important to this team. And if I took that role and did it really, really well, what a player I am. Yeah. Right. There's, and there's actually less pressure on you. So that would, that helps not only, so giving, helping kids define a role to a certain degree helps a coach coach them and helps a player play. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, so that was actually my next part is that the coaches, but the coaches need, so if a coach is giving assigning roles-ish, like I, I'm using that term, it's very, very important that why is explained. And I said this earlier because you take a kid – you take that type of person that thinks they're an offensive player, but they're just like really a two-way player. And you say, okay, you know, you're going to be played against top lines. You're going to shut them down. It's like, yeah, but I can score. Does that mean I get to score? Like it's important that they understand it. So it's important to understand like what your role is, how, how it's going to help you as a player and evolve as a player. And then as you were just talking to is if you're at a, a decent enough level that the next level is available, like you can get, at real competitive hockey, um, then ex- understanding that being goal a goal scorer is again not not that no one can do it, but it's very hard to be a goal an elite goal scorer and getting a job or getting to play where your school is paid for as a goal scorer. You need to bring more. So if you can teach that, you know, define a role and you can be really good at it and give them the why and why this is going to help our team so much and how we do this. The scouts will see you or whatever. Uh, then that just helps the player buy into a role. And you can have a healthy discussion about it. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be confrontational. It's not negative at all. It's like, it's actually really cool because if I say, Eric, you, you know, you are such a good penalty killer. And, right, I could just say, you're not on the power play on the penalty kill. Your role is defending. That's kind of abrasive. At the OHL, NHL level, college level, that might be the way it goes. But it's better if you can say, Eric, you're, you're um, I, I want you in the really important roles, penalty killing, defending, shutting guys down. Your chances are going to come offensively, but for our team to win, if you do this well, our team is going to have a much better chance of winning. You're going to have really good stats, uh, and you're going to carve yourself a role later on in life. That's you know, a better way to say it. That's that's such a – sorry, are you done there? Because that's a huge thing. Because I was just going to so – like the two things. One, when you're just talking about the, the idea of being a goal scorer – and I think one thing that's important to realize is if like if you want to be a goal scorer and be and be a hockey player, like if your goal is to be a professional hockey player, then you have to look at who your competition is. It's like, are you gonna compete with Austin Matthews? It's like when Austin Matthews played minor hockey, he was scoring three goals at will, three, four goals a game everywhere he went, no matter what. Right? It's like are you are you that? Are you that? Because that is who you it's not today that you're competing with that. But if you want to be a pro, that's who you're competing with, you know? And instead of that being something that's either you're naive about it, thinking you're that when you're not, or being discouraged by that, it's like, well, yeah, but there's all these other avenues, right? There's all these other avenues where Patrice Bergeron never led the league in points, but he got his point of game plus did all this other stuff that was really useful. It's like, oh, okay, maybe I can, maybe I can jump into that competition pool as opposed to the super elite whatever in, in terms of just being a goal scorer. So that, that's one thing. And the other thing you mentioned was 
the role kind of just being like a framework. Like the role is just your framework to work within, but you don't have to cap yourself off with only that. You know, like if you have a lane, take it. If you can make a play, make it. That doesn't mean you have to just never do those things. The goal now. scorer, you're allowed to hit. Yeah, exactly. Right. You can block a shot if you're the guy that's the playmaker. You know. So those those things are are really important. I think that's a, that's a good way to uh, to finish it off. Yeah, I got a couple more. Yeah, go. Sorry, I don't mean to belabor this. No, no, you don't have to. But I just got two two or three more, um, because I think this is important. Like, I know that it's hard for mom and dad. I know it's hard for a player sometimes to not be one number one at this or top two at, on the team at everything right i understand that i'm not being this is not even a critical way of saying it i get it because when when you know as a dad when someone says okay you're second line third line fourth line what you're saying to me and my son or my daughter whoever you are is that okay so on the team i'm number four not number one i'm like the least important right that's the that's how it could come across but it doesn't have to be that way what we have to understand is every role is actually important and 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 i think it's really important that coaches explain the importance of every role um and and i think it's important for the kids to embrace those roles even though they might disagree a little bit okay what we what you have to understand is that like and this is where a coach's job becomes critical is like it actually is you don't just take the guy that's the worst player on your team let's say and you say, okay, you just get to do this because you're, you know, the, the perception of it is you, you can do this because you're not that good. Yeah. The, the, it, it's, it's taking his role and making it something, right? So, like, I always use that one boy's example is, uh, you know, he wasn't skilled. He could skate fast, but he didn't have, like, real hockey IQ in any way. So I said, here's your role. Go hound dog the puck all day. And I, I, I did it at first. Because, well, I really didn't know what to do with him, but I, there was an asset there, and he did it very well, and he did it. I would, honestly, he made himself probably the best kid in our league at the time at doing that. He was just all over the puck. So he created value, and when, when you when you made him, he just felt good about doing that role after a while. If you teach people the even the tiniest things are the most important. Like, when you look at a football, I'm not a football guy by any means, but if you look at football and you see, uh, why is it, why is a, a quarterback able to make great plays? Well, if you really look at it, you look at the guards and the tackles. I think that's what the defensive side is, eh? the line. And there's there's some of these guys that just you ain't getting through. So he buys this guy's time. So the quarterback gets a ton of the credit on the highlight reels and on the whatever. But a lot of times you don't see that guy, you know, holding two guys back and just pivoting the right way and doing the right thing all the time. But without that guy. That quarterback sacked every second play or whatever, right? So these guys are critical. And it's like, it's not like, oh, yeah, that's kind of good. No, no, it's critical. So they need to be rewarded. And that role that you're playing for that quarterback just might not be the same glory. But that's, a, that's if hopefully you can accept that. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, that. Great, great point, man. So embrace, this is what I would say now, especially at a level where, I think the big shocker for most players is once they get out of youth hockey. So I'm going to say at this point, but like any point a coach gives you a, a role, I would embrace it and try to be the absolute best in the world at it. In the world. That's what I would say. Try. So to me, the big shocker is when you get to junior college pro. No, sorry. Junior at any level, college. Because pros, pro. You, you you really don't know what you don't know. So you get there and you're, you're the, the youngest and you got to find roles and you got to do something to get your ice time and stuff. And a coach might say to you, you, you can't score, man. Your, your hands are shit. Whereas you come from a team that you got, you were the goal scorer. Like that, the words might come out of his house, you're shit. I don't want you handling the puck. So that's like, you can sit there and go, oh, really? Yeah, and you're 16 and you're going to get three shifts a period. And it's going to be 23 seconds at the most. Anyways, here's your role. So over the over that first year and second year, take the role and actually try to be the best and figure out what you are. That might be talking to the coach. So if, if they say, for example, you're a shutdown forward or a shutdown D, 
take that, study it, and be the absolute best in the world, the best that you can to carve out a niche for yourself. Because if you are the best at what you do in your league or in the world at being a shutdown center, you will have a job. And it's not Sidney Crosby job. It's not Connor McDavid, but it's a job in the NHL. Whereas if you don't embrace that role and you want to do it your way or think that you can do everything, then you haven't specialized and you're vanilla. Everybody can be that. So if you can, if I know every time I rim that puck on your wall that it's coming out or 99.9% of the times, that's a value. If I know that you can get a puck deep and, you know, make plays with it, that's a value, whatever, right? So the so I would take your role and try to be the absolute best of the world at it. And even if that role is like a fourth, like let's just say a fourth line NHL player, that's a good, you're a good hockey player. But if you if you play fourth line NHL for 10 years or eight years, you've had a really good living. You're only playing like four to eight minutes a night. <laughs> you know, you still did it, you know. And then with that role, you could always add to it, right? You can maybe, you can get better in different areas possibly. Yeah, you can maybe move up a line and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think I think that's all I got. That's what you got? I think so. That was good, man. <clears throat> that's a good, uh, good wrap-up finish. So uh, hopefully that was some, somewhat interesting and helpful, a little more specific about the roles thing. Because I know in the, we mentioned that so many times in so many episodes about like find your three, four things, find your role, find this. And I th hopefully that helps to spell it out a little bit more clearly. So uh, as always, if you have any questions uh, for the members, you may uh, reach out and talk to us about it because, you know, that's a good thing to do. Yeah, it is. Uh, and for everyone else, we'll see you next week. <laughs>